first one is the, the long schedule for today had a typo. The lecture this afternoon is really going to be at 2 p.m. like every other day, not at 2.30. It's at 2. Tomorrow? Today. Ah. Today. Um, the, other, the other thing you need to announce is that the next speaker, uh, Ludovic Gassier, is uh, our next uh, distinguished lecturer. Uh, he's, he's a faculty in Montpellier in the south of France. Um, He's an outstanding uh, simulation theory guy, and he's also my, my running buddy. Uh, very approachable, very friendly. Uh, so please <laughs> go and talk to him if you run. If you, if you, if you, <laughs> <laughs> if you can run a question. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you, Patrick, for the introduction, for the invitation to the organizers. So as he said, I work in Montpellier. So those of you who don't know, Montpellier is a small city in France at the very south, close to the Mediterranean Sea. So if you take your bike in half an hour, you, go, you can go swimming to the Mediterranean Sea. And in three hours and a half, you take the train and you go to Paris and visit uh, all these uh, distinguished lecturers that you've seen before. So it's a really convenient place to, to work. It's a small place. Uh, we don't have a very big university. We have a small group, but we like having a visitor. So if you come to France, come and visit. We'll be happy to host you. Okay. So as uh, I said the other day, the goal of the lecture is to teach you the little bit I know about computer simulations uh, for uh, studying the glass uh, transition. So they have had they asked me to do exercise on the computer. I'm not really gifted with the computer, so you won't have to do exercise on uh, computers because I don't know how to do that myself. Okay. Um, I do not have a mobile phone myself, so I don't solve my problems with a mobile phone uh, either. So what I like best in the computer simulations that I do is that they are very simple, so you don't need to do a lot, to don't need to know a lot about computers. And the best part of, uh, of uh, uh, the part that I like best in the physics we do is really the physics part rather than the computational part, if you wish. So I won't bother you too much about details on computers because I don't know them very well. Okay. So the lectures that I have uh, prepared, they have been prepared uh, in consultation with uh, Gilles Targius and uh, Giulio Biroli. So the many concepts that you have been uh, exposed to in Gilles' uh, lectures about the phenomenology of glass forming liquid, you will find them again in what I do. And all the calculations, the mean field the concepts that Julio has introduced, you will also need them to understand what we try to do with computer simulations uh, in uh, this field. Okay, so the names, uh, point to set correlation lengths, entropy, etc., will uh, come back uh, all along again. Uh, so I have three lectures. By the end of uh, the three lectures, normally you should be ready to work with me, and you should be able to essentially uh, know as much as I do about computer simulations of glass forming liquids. So because I will be staying here two more weeks, I guess I'm happy to discuss with you whether you want to work with me for real. <laughs> but more seriously, projects that you'd like to do on these uh, topics, I'm happy to discuss and share and understand what you like to do on this uh, topic, okay? Uh, of course, as I said, uh, you are sometimes shy to ask questions to the lecturers. Remember what I told you the other day, I'm probably more shy than you are, okay? <laughs> so that's uh, my uh, introduction, okay? So the topic is uh, simulations of glass forming liquids, okay? So simulations of glass forming liquids. And as I said, that will be very, very basic, okay? Both on the computer and on the methods that uh, we use. So as uh, Gilles described to you, the experimental systems that we want to describe are uh, molecular liquids, polymer liquids, colloidal systems. So mostly if you want to do computer simulations of such systems, you will do simulations mostly of uh, classical fluid. Okay, so this is the main topic of the lectures is how do you simulate and what do you extract from those simulations when you consider uh, classical fluids? Okay, so mostly. So because we don't deal with quantum fluctuation itself, so we'll do classical simulations. And the two methods that we'd like to introduce are called molecular dynamics. And in the following molecular dynamics, probably I will call them uh, MD. And the second method that I will introduce and discuss and use uh, will be Monte Carlo simulations. OK. 
Okay, and these guys I will call uh, MC for Monte Carlo. So these are the two main methods that we will uh, discuss. So of course, in the field of glass forming liquids, we have our many theories, many models, many phenomenological models. So this is not the only types of computer simulations you would do. For instance, you would do, uh, and I've done that a lot myself, that's why I mentioned this. You could also do uh, simulations of simple spin models. And then here, the method to study these guys would be mostly Monte Carlo simulations for spin systems. And so the spin models that we use to describe the glass transition could be either you know, the spin glass types of interactions that have been mentioned several times, but also spin models without quench disorder. And there are tons of models like this uh, in this field. So I won't uh, discuss them very much, but they exist, and it's a, it's a chapter in the sense if you want it to be extensive about simulations of uh, the glass transition uh, problem. And of course, uh, we are mainly interested here in this room about the statistical physics properties of the glass transition, rather fundamental aspects of the glass transition, but there are whole communities that don't care too much about you know, the point to set lengths of the configurational entropy. They really want to describe, say, real materials, for instance. So in my life, for instance, there are people who do extensive simulations to describe real materials that people study in the lab. And uh, sometimes you need extremely realistic uh, uh, classical models for those, but you may need also the quantum uh, chemistry if you want. And so there are many people that do ab initio simulations of glasses. And this also exists, and I won't touch about uh, these things because I, do, I know even less about these uh, approaches. But for instance, one problem that this study is uh, you know, using real glasses to store nuclear waste, for instance. So here you need to know how the glass is going to react with, uh, you know, if you have water coming in. So you need to describe the chemistry, how the bonds are, break, are broken and stuff. So it's, it's crucial to have uh, ambitious simulations to describe those things. But that's not the topic uh, that we <coughs> consider today. But of course, it's uh, truly uh, an important field as well that I won't uh, describe at all. Okay, so <coughs> perhaps the first question you should ask yourself is why doing simulations? Okay. So in a sense, what I would like to do now is just to explain why it's interesting for me to give a lecture here. So why do we do simulations in that uh, field at all? So I guess, uh, I hope, or maybe you didn't, but maybe you understood that doing a detailed theory for the glass transition is not uh, that easy. So detailed theory for the glass transition is difficult. Okay, so we heard a lot in uh, Julio's lectures about how the mean field theory is constructed. You saw that it's not uh, very simple already. And he mentioned that for finite dimensions, we don't, do, we don't know how to do many, many things. And that the theory itself is not well developed or understood, and the concepts are not so clear in finite dimensions. So if we had the fi a final theory for the glass transition, maybe the simulations would not be so relevant. But because we don't have it, then the simulations can give you uh, a clue about the real behavior in finite dimensional system. What about the fluctuations that uh, Julio could not capture very well, etc. So uh, Gilles mentioned that we have all these uh, zillions of theories or phenomenological models for the glass transition. So models are cool, but they are mostly empirical. So maybe they are right, maybe they are wrong. They have to be tested, just the, th as the theory has to be tested. And this is also where uh, simulations come uh, handy. At least the simulations are close to the reality and you can check in detail what's happening in them. So you can test these models uh, in uh, simulations. What I like about simulations as well is that, you know, they don't describe the reality, but they're usually much simpler than experiments. In the sense that you know exactly in the simulations what you've put into your system, you know what you simulate, you know the equations of motion, you don't have problems with vibrations, something broken in the experiment, some impurities coming in in the sample, etc. That does not exist in experiments. 
Of course, it's important to understand what's happening and these experimental results are nice, but experiments sometimes are much harder to interpret because they are very complicated. Okay, so in the simulations, we know all the ingredients we put in because we decide what the model we study and we can simplify the experimental systems quite a bit. So I will spend a lot of time discussing the physics of hard spheres, for instance. Okay. So this is a hard spherical object and that's, uh, you know, a good representation of what a real molecule would be in an experimental system. So Mark Ediger will tell you that in a real experiments, you have real molecules. These guys are very complicated. They are far from the hard sphere system that we do in simulations or they do in theory, for instance. So maybe he will complain. I hope he will. And he will challenge the view that you can describe molecules by hard spheres and that these models are not really good. But this is what we do. So we can simplify a lot the chemistry, etc. And we do simple models where all ingredients are well known, controlled, simplified to, you know, to the bone in a sense. And of course, the good things about simulations is that we, we see all the atoms at all times. Okay. So Mark Ediger is a very good, excellent experimentalist, but he can't see the molecules that he's uh, studying. He can't visualize them, he cannot follow them, and he cannot uh, study their properties at this level of description. So we have seen yesterday posters about you know, choroidal experiments where you can see the particles, and that's good, but this is not atoms. This is also a simplified model for the choroidal trans gas transition. Very nice. <laughs> so it's different from a uh, simulation in the sense, and it's simplified as well, but it's again far from the, uh, the physics that Gilles uh, has described. Okay? So the good thing about simulations is that we do the impossible. That is things that Mark Ediger cannot do and we no, uh, he will never be able to do them. So we do the impossible things. Okay. So for instance, we heard many times about the theories in infinite dimensions. So one thing we can easily do in the simulation is change the dimensionality of the system. Okay, I can study hard spheres in two, three, four, five dimensions, and that's okay. Mark cannot do uh, auto definite in five dimensions, and we can. Okay, so we can do this. We can study, for instance, very small systems, with very large systems. We can very easily, you know, how many particles we put, look at finite size effects, detect important length scales, stuff like this. We can study uh, uh, spaces that are different from the space we live in, like curved spaces. Okay, so we heard yesterday the joke that uh, Julio made about hyperbolic plane of curved space. This you can do in a simulation. It's been done for good reason, theoretical motivations. You can do that in a simulation. In an experiment, you can't do it. We can measure many complicated things. Okay, so that's I think probably. <coughs> so we heard from GL and from Julio that you have these multi-point time correlation functions, four-point functions, point-to-set correlation lengths, complicated susceptibilities. All this you get you know, for free in the simulations. In an experiment, it would be pretty hard to do. And this is where I think the simulations have, done, uh, uh, have been able to uh, make progress in the last uh, few years. Okay, we can study things like potential energy landscape, free energy landscapes in the simulations that, again, are very hard to do in an experiment. And all this, I think, is a good list of reasons why you should be interested in uh, understanding and knowing something about computer simulations for the glass uh, transition. Okay? So even though you do ex even if you do experiments or you do theory, I think you have to know something about simulations if you want to read the papers we write with a critical eye. Okay? So that's useful for all of you, I'm saying. Okay? So what are the very simple models that we consider? So they are not molecules. They are very simplified models for classical fluids. So if you open <laughs> books about liquid state theories, you will find the list of these models. And usually when we do, uh, I don't know, uh, condensed matter physics and we want to describe uh, materials, probably the simplest uh, pair potential that we study is a lennard jones pair potential. So what we do in computer simulations is we usually, but not everybody does it, we study isotropic uh, systems. The pair inter interactions work in pairs. Okay, so we have isotropic pair interactions for point-like objects. So 
So these are the simplest type of simulations you could do. So instead of having, you know, rigid bodies or something, the particles we study are exactly points, and they are defined by the interactions between pairs of these uh, points. So the Lennard-Jones potentials that I wanted to, to describe, it, it's maybe the most, uh, if you wish, realistic model for a classical fluid. So the pair interactions between particle i and particle j located at position ri and rj. So the pair potential would be uh, described by something like this. So the interactions between these two guys would be v of ri oh, sorry, minus rj, okay, with the function which is isotropic and only depends on the distance. And this pair potential for the lennard jones system would be written like this. So there is a 4 for historical reasons, and sometimes the 4 disappears, I understand. And you have two parameters in this pair potential. Okay, so one parameter in the is this epsilon, which essentially sets the energy scale in the pair potential. And the second parameter is sigma, that essentially describes the uh, diameter of the particle. So remember, these particles are point-like objects, but sigma is essentially describing, you know, the... Uh, this is a short-range repulsion, so as R becomes smaller than sigma, the repulsion is very strong, the particles cannot interpenetrate, and sigma is a good description for the diameter. And that's the classical model for a fluid, if you wish, okay? So it has a distance, it has an energy, so you can study this system as a function of temperature and the pressure or density, if you wish. And this is how liquids in the lab are controlled as well. Okay, so that's uh, Leonard Jones. Well, I've done Leonard Jones, but uh, we tend to simplify these uh, uh, systems quite a bit. So you see that the potential is, sorry, I, I should have described, has a steep repulsion at short distances, so the particles cannot really interpenetrate. And it has a longer range, slightly attraction uh, at larger distances. So typically the potential <laughs> looks uh, something like this. It's short repulsion and then long range um, uh, repulsion with the minimum at a given uh, distance. So that's the typical uh, form of this potential. So sometimes we don't care about attractive forces and we simplify this into a subsphere system and we would study something like V of R, which is some epsilon sigma divided by R to the 12 or to the any number that you like. So you can essentially remove these guys and you're left with a soft repulsion at short distance and it's a simpler model if you wish. So this guy, again, has an epsilon and a sigma, but they appear in a funny combination here. So it means that the phase diagram of this system is much simpler because it only depends on one uh, control parameter, if you wish, which is a combination of the length and the uh, energy here. Okay. So that's why it's, it's nice, because it's so much simpler than the Lena Jones. You don't have to study a two-dimensional phase diagram, but just a one-dimensional line. Okay. So Patrick is in the room, and I like this system very much. We also study a hard version of this uh, uh, steep repulsion, in a sense, and that's the hard sphere system, so where the pair potential is infinity when you're smaller than the diameter of the particle, and the pair potential is zero when the uh, distance between the particles is larger than their diameter. So it's a very steep uh, repulsion, infinitely steep repulsion, and here the, uh, the pair potential is the one of a hard spherical object. So no interactions and infinitely uh, strong uh, repulsion at short distances. So that's the hard sphere system. Again, there is no energy scale here, so you only have a, a length scale in the definition of the pair potential. So it's, it's controlled essentially by the density, if you wish, or by the pressure equivalently. So again, it's a one-dimensional phase diagram that you have to study. Hence, it's much simpler. And this is, uh, if you wish, a historical model for liquid state uh, theory. And if you open any book on liquids, then this is the canonical model to describe their physics, because it's so much simpler. Um, I want to describe another type of subsphere. Maybe I should change the name and call them by their real name harmonic spheres, okay, because you will hear probably a lot about this per potential uh, sometime later in the school. OK, 
case. So it's a pair potential which is repulsive at short distances, and the repulsion is harmonic in the overlap between the particles. And the potential is zero if R is larger than sigma. So it's a soft version of the hard sphere system where you have no interactions when the particles don't overlap, and you have a, non, a finite repulsion at short distances, which is harmonic. So harmonic means that probably it's, it has simple properties. And you will probably hear a lot about this uh, potential in the lecture that Andre Liu is going to give about the jamming transition because it has been studied and used a lot in the context of uh, the jamming transition in the uh, recent years. Okay, so these are the types of uh, very simple uh, pair potentials that I'm going to use uh, in these lectures. So maybe just uh, for the curiosity, if you want to describe a real material like uh, window glasses, so silica glasses, oxide glasses, so so this is you know what a real model, a real model, real material, a real glass looks like in uh, in reality. So if you want to describe this, you have to have a pair potential that knows about which atom you are, so silicon or oxygen. So the pair potential that people use then depends on two. Uh, and depending on if you have a silicon, 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 oxygen, oxygen, oxygen interaction, so alpha and beta can be either uh, of the two species. I just want to write it down to show you how more complicated it is. And in this system, you have charges, okay? So it means that you have Coulomb repulsions between these atoms, and the empirical description of this guy contains many parameters that people have been using. So you have an exponential term here, and you have a long range also repulsion between the species, and all the parameters Q alpha, Q beta, A alpha beta, C alpha beta, B, have been adjusted empirically to reproduce what people observe in the lab, studying window glasses, essentially. So you tune these parameters, and then you do your computer simulations, and you find a structure and a dynamic that looks like the real thing. But the price to pay, of course, is that the pair potential is very complicated. So depending on the question you're asking, then presumably you would prefer studying the hard sphere system. That's so much simpler as compared to this guy. But if you want to understand silica, then you have to pay this price. So these are simple models. So Gilles mentioned at the beginning something like uh, it's very simple to study the glass transition in the lab. You cool the system fast enough, it does not crystallize, and here you go, you study the viscosity, for instance. So all the models that I've described here, they are very simple as compared to the complex molecules that Mark is studying. So avoiding the crystal in the simulation, it's not as simple as Gilles uh, suggested the other day. So crystallization. It's complicated, okay? And you cannot go away with the crystallization in a simulation. You always have to pay attention to this problem. We don't want to study the crystal. We want to study the disordered state. So we have to remove the crystal somehow. So we have to work hard on how we do the simulations to prevent crystallization. And even if we do, it's not guaranteed that the system is not going to crystallize. And plenty of papers probably have been published where you know you have funny behavior just because the people had not looked carefully at whether the system had crystallized or not. So you have to be extremely careful about this. So what we do to have a hope that the system is not going to crystallize, we use mixtures of particles. Okay, so instead of having one species, for instance, the hard spheres, you take two species with two different diameters, and you hope that because they have uh, different diameters, there will be some kind of frustration preventing crystallization. So we use mixtures uh, a lot, it works. So you can have binary mixtures, ternary mixtures, you know, as many components as you want, provided that you have a model that at the end of the day does not crystallize. So it's painful to have mixtures because then you have to pay attention to which atom is doing what. But that's the price to pay if you want to do a serious simulation of the glass transition. And we say it's motivated by the fact that some experimental systems are mixtures. And it's true that metallic glasses, for instance, they are made of binary, ternary, pentary mixtures of different uh, uh, atoms. And this is how metallic glass people avoid the crystallization as well. So it has some experimental relevance. 
uh, some, sometimes we also use uh, continuous distributions. So we say in that case the, the system has a continuous polydispersity. Okay, so for instance, in the case of hard spheres, you could have a distribution of particle diameters. And if the distribution is big enough, then the system has small particles, big particles, intermediate sized particles, and you hope that these mixtures will be hard to crystallize. And we say, oh, but it's relevant also because in colloidal systems, they also have, uh, you know, because of the chemistry involved in the uh, synthesis of the colloidal particles, the system has a distribution of diameters. Not all colloids are the same. You could see that again in the post uh, yesterday. So that's if, if you wish uh, an experimental justification of why we are using this continuous polydispersity. Sorry? Yes. But why uh, would you be worried about crystallization and simulation? Oh, so you're saying, okay. Well, I, s I think if we, if we had the slow, the type of cooling that they do in experiments, all the model I've described to you, they would all be perfect crystals because they would have so much time to reach the crystal. So it's true that as compared to experiments, we gain because we don't have the same time scales as you suggest. So that's why the models can be simple and can be studied in the simulation. Um, but you have to remember what I said at the beginning, that the types of glasses that you will see in Mark Ediger's uh, talks, for instance, are extremely complex as compared to the type of... So I think the experiments are much slower and also they, are, they have more complex objects, not point-like particles that interact with hard spheres. And because of this complexity, then it's harder to crystallize, even though they have much uh, smaller, uh, slower cooling rates. So I think they, they, they compensate the slow cooling rates by having more complex systems. So if we had this ability to, slow as, uh, to cool as slow as in experiments, we should, we should increase even more the polydispersity and the complexity of the molecules to prevent crystallization. But for the types of simulations we do for now, we have a good glass forming system that do not easily crystallize. So that's uh, the conclusion I would like to, to draw, is that we do have uh, good glass models. Okay, because we've worked hard, the community has worked hard to study models that do not easily crystallize, can be simulated. And, you know, they don't crystallize so easily for the time scale that we are able uh, to simulate. So perhaps that conclusion is a little bit optimistic. And again, I hope that Mark is going to challenge that view that we have good glass forming systems. And I think he's going to give his lectures next week. And I hope he will say that we don't have good glass former, uh, 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 good models for glass forming systems. And I guess someone like Gilles, for instance, is always saying that the models that we study in the simulations even though they have the right phenomenology, they don't quite look like the real uh, molecules that are studied in experiments. So I think the truth is that we don't really know yet whether the models we have are you know, good representation of the experiments or you know, caricatures of the experiments. And the reason we don't know is what she said, that there is a gap between what they do in experiments and what we do in simulations. And so because we cannot compare directly yet, um, we don't really know whether they are good or bad, I think. So that's... Uh, <coughs> that a fair view, Gilles, of the situation. Okay. So that's uh, the introduction. So we have models now of uh, glass formers. I try to convince you of this uh, fact. So what do you do now in the simulation? Okay, so you take your favorite pair potential, hard spheres, Lennard Jones, South sphere, something. You do Monte, Monte Carlo dynamics, you do uh, molecular dynamics, something. And the basic outcome of your simulation then that you have a system that's composed of n hard spheres on n Lennard Jones particles and the basic outcome of a simulation is essentially the positions of all these particles at all times during your simulations and that's it. So that's what you have at the end of your simulation on your hard disk. You have the positions of the particle for the duration so for a time which is between zero and say the simulation time. And that's it. That's all you can have in a computer simulation. 
and now you have to, cons to compare the outcome of this to the complicated theories or experiments that have been done. So you have to work a little bit to make this uh, connection. Yes? Yes. Why, why don't we complicate our uh, pair uh, interest pairs? Uh, in you can do uh, uh, pair potential and then you find interest Yeah, so, so that was my answer to her. I mean, if you want to, this is just one type of, one way of avoiding crystallizations, but you're just limited by your imagination, I think. So if you have an idea that, you know, a specific type of three particle interaction is going to be super efficient in suppressing crystallization, just do it. Perfect. But why do we go to mischief? It's well, it's just my choice, okay? If you prefer staying with uh, a monocomponent and make it very complex, change, uh, changing the, the functional form of the pair potential, you're free. If it works, beautiful. There are very few examples of monocomponent complicated pair potentials that do not crystallize. So perhaps the, uh, um, you know, the reason why I described this is that because it's, it's, it is still simple and it works efficiently. Okay? If there had been a very good idea of you know, keeping monocomponent systems, not too complicated pair potential and it would prevent crystallization, I think this paper would have thousands of citations today, but it does not exist. Well, uh, if you have, again, uh, molecules are that are extremely simple, so Jill said if you try to, cr to avoid crystallization in argon, you'll never be able to do it. If they use orthoterphenyl, which is a complicated molecule, it's only orthoterphenyl, it's what one type of molecule, but the molecule is complex, okay? So it's, if you wish, a one family system made of a complicated object, and that complicated object is enough to prevent the crystallization in an experiment. So in a sense, that's an answer to the first part of your question. You can get away, but then you have to describe molecules with, you know, geometry and degrees of freedom inside. I think it's just uh, efficiency. What's the simplest thing you can do to, say, work on the glass transition? Okay. Um, Okay, so the question I wanted to raise is, okay, now I give you a set of uh, positions for n particles, you know, simulated uh, for a given amount of time, so 10 to the 5 decades, say, and then you have to describe the glass transition with these uh, uh, positions of the particles. So what's the viscosity? What's the point to set length? What's the chi for susceptibility? And you have to start from the uh, positions of the particle at all times because that's only what you get at the end of a simulation. So you have to work hard to do it, and that's uh, what I want to describe now, but I take that question before. Will the empirical model facilitate Sorry? The empirical model facilitate, will that crystallize? No, this guy does not crystallize. I think the parameters there have been adjusted to, to precisely not crystallize and to give a structure that really looks like the, well, that is close to the, uh, structure of real silica glaciers. That's purely empirical. I cannot explain why it works, why it reproduces silica, because it's, you know, it's purely empirical thing. And it turns out that it does not easily crystallize. Okay? No, and I don't really care about it myself, so. <coughs> Okay, so how do I we extract the relevant information? So we need to extract the relevant information. Okay, and so that's the types of things that I would like to describe today. Today it will be very basic, and by the end of the third lectures, in principle, I will have extracted things like the configurational entropy, the point to set correlation lengths, and etc. the quantities that Julio and Gilles uh, have mentioned. Today it's all very basic, so it's essentially uh, 
the beginning of any book on uh, liquid state theory. So these guys are liquids. So if you want to describe uh, liquids that are viscous near the glass transition, you have to learn about the physics of liquids. So it will be just half an hour about liquid state theory. And then you have to super cool the guy, learn a little bit about the state map <laughs> of disordered systems. Fortunately, you had the lectures before. <laughs> And this is uh, the travel I want to do. So take the particle uh, uh, trajectories and extract everything, some of dynamics, structure, interesting length scales, etc. So we start with the basics. So once we have the positions of the particle at a given time, the most basic field that you can extract is the density field. Okay. Okay, so we heard a lot about density profiles and amorphous density profiles, so you have to start with something. So out of the positions of the particle at a given time, you extract the density field. So that's the basic object that you have. So that's given by something like this. So it's a sum of delta function. So each particle is located at the position uh, ri at time t. You sum over all these delta functions for the n particles. And that's your instantaneous density profile in the liquid. And so that's the density field. Okay, so if you well if you were to measure the average of this guy uh, over the entire space, so 1 over v integral of this density. So if you integrate over the entire volume of this delta function, so each particle is going to give you a 1. So you get n divided by v. And n divided by v, by construction, is the average number density. So that's uh, just tell you how you reconstruct the density as you know it, number of particles per unit volume, in terms of the microscopic density field constructed from the uh, positions of the particles. So that's the basic object that uh, you can construct. So that's the density profile. So as we heard many times in the talks before, we know that density profiles in supercooled liquids are rather boring objects, so we won't get away with just the density profiles. But this is how we need to start. Okay. So let's start with the density profile. So from the density profile, we can look at the fluctuations of the density. Okay, and we define something like the. So that would be the density minus this average, which I just uh, defined. So this is the instantaneous deviations. Uh, from the uh, average density at each position in space. Okay. And from these objects, we can construct a two-point correlation, uh, as Jill uh, mentioned several times. So we could you know, start with this object. So this is how they do it in box. You construct the two-point density density correlation function. Okay, so you have a fluctuation at position R. At the same time, you have fluctuations at position R prime. You take the average of this uh, product, and you got a two-point uh, correlation function at uh, time t. So if your liquid is sorry, isotropic and homogeneous and everything, then this guy obviously will only depend on the, uh, the modulus of R minus R prime for isotropic homogeneous system. Yes. It's an ensemble average, ensemble average. So for now, it's not too relevant, but later we'll be a bit more precise about averages. You're right, uh, Guillaume. OK, so these delta rows are you know, rho minus rho, so I can essentially rewrite it like this. So this g is. Uh, it's rho, so I do it like this, minus rho zero squared. So it's the product of the density minus uh, the average squared. And if you remember that rho is this uh, sum of, our, uh, d of delta functions of everybody, then you plug these uh, delta functions and these sums in this system. And you can decompose into several terms here. So the first term is when you know you have a double sum, sum over i, sum over j. The first term is when i is equal to j. And you can easily verify that this is going to give you a trivial single particle contribution to this. 
then you have a term where explicitly you can write it like this r minus r i delta r prime minus r j like this and then you have the minus for zero squared okay so that's the single particle contribution that is uh, the non-trivial con contribution to this uh, product and this by definition we call rho zero squared g of r minus r prime okay so that's uh, really basic stuff in liquid state theory and we introduce this small g here because this is the function that uh, Gilles has mentioned uh, before so you start from the density look at the fluctuations and then out of these two point function there is one function that we really like and that's called the pair correlation function oh. so that's the say basic object that people have been studying in liquid state theory for uh, yes. I don't know if I have another one. I'm sorry, I'm as bad as everybody else. So if you think about the meaning of this uh, average of delta function is the probability that you have a particle at position r prime and at the same time you have a particle at position r elsewhere in the system. Another way of saying is that if you consider the quantity rho zero times g of r is the density at distance r from a particle located at i equals to zero. Okay, so you take one particle in the liquid, you put it at the origin and you look at the density around this particle. So this is why in you know the cover of many textbooks on liquid state theory you say you know, I look at this particle, I say it's at the origin, and I look at the density profile at distance r from this, okay? And rho zero times g of r is the density at uh, distance r from this particle. So that's uh, its meaning. One minute, uh, I will be answering the question. And I think Gilles sketched what the g of r looks like for an ordinary liquid. It's something that's zero at short distances because you already have one particle so you cannot put another one then you have a sharp, relatively sharp peak and then you have oscillations that die away because at large distances the system is homogeneous and you recover the uh, average density you have a question about the pair correlation function Patrick? Yeah, isn't that the same function that uh, Henry was talking about also in the end of his lecture? <coughs> Thanks Okay. Okay, I, I will plot it as well later. Okay, sorry, Gilles. I was not uh, careful enough. Okay. So we have this pair correlation function that describes essentially the local uh, structure of the system of a disordered uh, fluid, a dense but disordered fluid. Okay. Uh. Oh. Okay, so we are already describing locally uh, the microscopic properties of the density field and its uh, correlation. If we, if we want to go up and catch up with the uh, calculations Julio wanted to do, then we have to go up and go to the thermodynamic properties. Okay, so just a few relations to illustrate how you go from the particles up to the large scale fluctuations and things that you can measure uh, in experiments and that's the connection between what I do and what Gilles uh, has described in a sense. So what function do I have? I have uh, several but I will probably just do, so imagine that you 
want to study the energy of the system, which is one basic uh, thermodynamic quantity. So typically what we'll have is we'll have uh, kinetic energies for our particles, for the energy, and we'll have the... So I don't know if I put like this. You know, we have the pair interactions, which is the potential energy. So we have a kinetic and a potential energy. Now, if you want to measure, say, the average uh, total energy in the system, so this average of your, then the first part is relatively trivial because that's equipartition. Okay, and then you have to compute the average of this guy. So you can introduce my delta functions like this, and you'll have this equality, which is relatively <coughs> trivial to show. So you have R minus R prime, like this, rho of R, rho of R prime. And I want to compute the average of this guy. OK, so I just introduced uh, rho is a sum of delta functions. So if you put back the definition of rho, you'll get back these discrete sums uh, at the end of the day. Okay. Now, if I look at this average, then the quantity that I have to average is the average of a product of a row of, a, of two densities. And the product of densities is the correlation function that I've just defined, which is related to the pair correlation function. So if you compare this to what I wrote before, then you'll have an expression for the energy, which is still the, this guy. And then I take the perfectiles from my notes, and you get rho 0 n divided by 2 integral of a volume v over, v over, and that's it. So it means that you go from the positions of the particle, you construct your pair correlation function, you take your pair correlation function, you put that into your integral, you get something which is the total energy average. So you can do thermodynamics from the particle positions. That's already uh, interesting. So we go to larger and larger scale. So I continue to go up. And I want to connect to experiments before connecting to a Julio. OK. So simple things you can do again. So you can do thermodynamic fluctuations. And so I have one such example. So imagine that you know you have this cartoon that you have in all textbooks on thermodynamics. Okay, so you take a subsystem which has a volume V, which is inside what's called the reservoir, so a much larger system. And you're asking something about the fluctuations of thermodynamic observable in this system. So you could, for instance, decide to look at the fluctuations in the total number of particles inside the subsystem. So we saw earlier that the number of particles is the integral of the density. So you can rewrite this as, so we'll go quickly, just because what I want to illustrate is rather the concepts rather than the detailed, uh, the detailed uh, uh, equation, say. So the integral of uh, rho is the number. So the integral of delta rho squared would be the, number, the fluctuations in the number. So if I do this product, I will have again a product of delta rho times rho. This is again related to the pair correlation function. I give you the results. And if you do these integrals, what you get whoops, <coughs> is something that is n times 1 plus rho 0 integral again of the pair correlation function minus 1. Okay, so just uh, uh, trivial manipulations of the definitions I gave uh, before. Okay. So if you ask an experimentalist uh, what these guys is, it's related to a function that can be measured experimentally. And that function is this one. It's chi t. And it's called the isothermal compressibility. And its definition in thermodynamics, it's minus 1 over V dV by dP at constant volume, at constant uh, temperature. So it's the relative change of the volume if you change the pressure of the system. 
So this is something that you would measure experimentally in the liquid by doing a large scale experiment. You've changed the pressure, you look at the relative change of the volume, you measure that thing. And what I've done in this expression, so this guy is equal to this, it's directly related to something that is measured directly from the positions of the particles. So this is, uh, if you wish, a relevant experimental response function for the system. It's char characterizing the physics at very large scale. And I've been able to connect that to essentially the positions of the particles. So that's uh, why it's nice to illustrate this um, today. Okay. So connection with uh, what Gilles has shown now. So he's shown the structure factor, and that will be the last of my uh, liquid state thing. So Gilles was working in the Fourier space as compared to the real space. So when you do simulations, presumably you prefer to do real space calculations because this is uh, the most natural thing to do. In experiment, they do, uh, for instance, diffraction, neutron, diff diffraction of neutrons, and what they get is something in the Fourier space. So they shine the light in a given direction. They observe at a given angle what's uh, uh, diffracted by the system. Something that they measure is you know, some signal which is proportional to the quantity that uh, Gilles has mentioned, which is the static structure factor. And in terms of the uh, observables I defined before, it would be the average of the density profile in Fourier space at wave vector k times the density at vector minus k. You take the average of this, and you get what experimentalists may be able uh, to, to measure, OK? So this is the Fourier transform of the uh, density. So if you explicitly write down the Fourier transform, you will have an integral over r of rho of r, an integral over r of rho of r. So you have, again, a product of rho times rho. So you can connect that again to the uh, pair correlation function. I just give you the result. OK, so it's in any textbook, but it's uh, pretty straightforward, that uh, one line that I skipped. Okay, so you'll have the Fourier transform of what's left, which is, again, this g of r minus 1. Okay, so this is uh, something that is measured experimentally, and that's, again, the quantity I described before, the pair correlation function. So these guys are essentially Fourier transform from one another, so they contain the same information. And I just sketch again the thing that Gilles uh, has produced. So this is the typical shape of a structure factor measured experimentally. And this time you have a peak at a distance, which is uh, not the diameter, but the 2 pi divided by the diameter, because we are in Fourier space. Yeah. <coughs> So we're almost done with this exercise. Yes. <laughs> okay, so that's the part I wanted to skip. Thanks. Uh, so if. <laughs> So if, if you take the limit of k going to zero, you recognize the integral that I wrote uh, just above. Yes, so the, it can be not uh, zero. Yes, it, it's small. You're right, sorry. I do that mistake all the time. You're right. OK, so I don't skip it. I give you the result. So this guy is non-zero, and it's rho kt times the compressibility. You're right. OK? So th that may look boring, but just to summarize, what are the type of information you might gain by looking at the pair correlation function? Uh, it's not in my notes. So remember the sketch I had for G of R. Okay, so it's really a sketch. It's ugly at stuff. So what are, what are the type of information that we may learn from two-point correlation functions? So Gilles said nothing okay, for the glass transition. So maybe it's a bit uh, abrupt. So what uh, is certainly true is you have a physics of uh, you know, two particles coming very close to one another. And if you uh, 
remember this plot and you'll have uh, these lectures on the jamming transition next week probably by uh, Andrea Leo when you have two hard spheres that come into close contact all the physics of the jamming transition will be essentially contained in the percorrelation function for an interparticle distance which would be essentially the diameter between the particles so the jamming physics is essentially the physics of this uh, first peak here so it has a lot of informationity in, in it and all the criticality of jamming is there okay, so it's something uh, interesting uh, shorter distances we don't really care uh, distances at the distance of two or third neighbors there are you know, plenty of papers that discuss the physics of what they call medium range order I know essentially nothing about them but it's a whole community of people discussing specific arrangements in space of you know two or three particles uh, uh, distances so it's medium range order in liquids so if you go to very large distances that corresponds to his question low uh, wave vectors in the structure factor compressibility physics large distances for a long time people say there is nothing interesting happening there for the compressibility and then there is a series of papers by uh, Torquato in Princeton who claims that the interesting physics of glasses is contained at k going to zero limit and is related to the concept of hyper uniformity extremely large scale density fluctuations again there is a group of people interested in these large uh, large distances low wave vectors properties of density field in disordered systems so there is a lot to do at the level of two body uh, correlation functions I would say okay so we want to study the glass transition so we want to do dynamics at the end of the day because it's about the viscous slowing down so we want to compute something about how the particles not only are organized in space but how they move so we want to compute time correlation function okay so again Jill gave uh, basic definitions on how to define these things so you take an observable that depends on time so for simplicity I will assume that the average of this guy is uh, zero just not to subtract the uh, uh, you know the connected part of time correlation functions and the time correlation function of this observable will be something that looks like uh, the product of these guys at two different times so we look at quantities like c t t prime which are product of t okay so again this is an ensemble average and of course for this function to have a meaning you need that these two guys are computed at different times in the same trajectory okay so you make the product and then you repeat uh, this trajectory a large number of times or you use ergodic hypothesis and you do a time integral of this and you get an expression for your time correlation function okay. so as Gilles also mentioned so we hope that this guy will only depend on the difference of times if you reach uh, equilibrium and you reach uh, steady state but there are also many people in the field that you know the cases where the system is not uh, stationary and this is what you will find for instance in aging glasses and I think that's been said uh, before okay so what are the time correlation functions that we measure usually so I go quick because Jill already mentioned something so maybe the most basic observable would be the time evolution of the density density correlation function okay. okay so it's almost uh, as before the product of two densities in the Fourier space but of course the relevant difference here is that the two times uh, are not the same so we are comparing the density profile at time zero to the density profile at time k okay and it's called the intermediate scattering function that Gilles has sketched uh, several times uh, in his lectures as well 
scattering function. Okay, so in simulation, sometimes we simplify this expression. So if you look at, I shouldn't write too low, probably. So we should move uh, this guy doesn't move. So if you look at this expression here, fk is 1 over n, sum over i, j, okay, so that's some kind of a complicated object. Sometimes we take d just the, the part where the two particles are the same in that sum, so it's called the same part. That's probably the correlation function that I have measured the largest number of times in my life. So that's this quantity. Okay, where well you have just the same index uh, i in the two things. So you essentially asked uh, the particle i between time 0 and time t, how long, you know, ha what is the distance it has traveled? You compare that to a typical wave vector. And that's giving you uh, a time correlation function related to single particle displacements. Okay. So that's the self part of the intermediate scattering function. If you look at very low wave vectors, so you can do an expansion of this guy. So you will have, have one plus something proportional to k whose average will be zero. And then you'll have the second uh, term, which is the square of these uh, uh, displacements here. That's again a quantity that we compute a lot in simulations of supercooled liquid. And that's the mean square displacement. And that's a quantity, that's the square of this. Uh, okay. And from this quantity at long times, you can extract the diffusion constant. Okay. Okay, and this guy ds would be the diffusion constant. So that's typically one thing you can measure and compare to experiments, uh, quantifying the, dyne, uh, the viscous slowing down uh, as Gilles has described uh, before. Okay. Maybe I will introduce overlaps now, just because then it will be done once and for all. Okay, so in the context of uh, dynamic correlation functions, it's probably useful to connect to the types of observables that uh, Julio has described, which was this uh, overlap function. So instead of going in the context of replica, I think it's nice to see it in the context of time correlation functions. So let me define an overlap like this from my the positions of the particles. Okay. Something like i, j. So that's a theta function, a heavy size function. I introduce a microscopic length a. Tac and tac. And tac. And the average like this. So this is a time dependent of our lab. And essentially, the physics of this guy is the same physics of this fk. Uh, of t, so it's co it's it's the time correlation, if you wish, of density profiles. Okay, so you take the density at time t, you correlate that to the density at time uh, uh, t plus t prime later, and you ask whether there is a correlation between the two density profiles. So instead of doing it for a given wave vector k, here we do it in the real space, and we ask. You know, if there was a particle at position zero somewhere, so the particle was j, is there still a particle at time t later at the same position? And that particle could be different one, could be particle i. So the only difference with, uh, so remember that the density profile is a sum of delta function. So in space, the density would be delta function each time you have uh, a particle somewhere. So if you compare one density profile at time zero, 
To another density profile at time t, typically the correlations between the two density profiles is zero because the particles have moved a little bit and the delta functions are not exactly at the same position. So what we do here, instead of comparing the density profiles, we introduce some kind of a coarse graining length for the density. So we replace that delta function by something that has a width a, like this, okay? And now this overlap is essentially asking the question, are the red density profiles and the white density profiles at the coarse grain level, are they similar or not? Okay, so we don't ask that the particles are exactly the same positions, but they are the same positions within a coarse graining length, which is A, okay? And that's uh, how I will compare density profiles either in time, between time zero and T, or between copies of the system, between replicas of the system in the second or third uh, lecture. So that's the definition of an overlap in the real simulations of a supercooled liquid, which is not a spin system, yes? How does the cost lining length, length correspond to the particle radius? So of course for this to be meaningful, if A is super small, then I did nothing. If A is super large, I did too much. So it has to be comparable to the particle diameter. Typically, we, we take a fraction of sigma. Just because then you don't want to mix the position of two particles if you cause grain too much. So that's the typical thing. So typically, I take 0.2 in my simulation. And I play a little bit to check that it's robust against uh, the change of uh, A. But you don't have a lot of room to play with this thing. And maybe before going to the history, so we looked at uh, overlaps, and that's uh, useful for the next uh, lectures. So Gilles started his lecture by talking about the increase of the viscosity by 15 orders of magnitude. So how, how do you go from the particle positions and trajectories to the viscosity? And again, this is something we know. So I read the definition. It won't be very useful just to give you an idea of how this is done. So it's 1 over the volume times KBT times the... I don't know why I have a T here, infinity. So it's not terribly useful uh, yet. So it's the uh, time integral of a correlation function of a current J, which I will define in a second. So you don't need to know that by heart, but just to illustrate that it only depends on the velocities and the particle positions. Okay, so you construct this current uh, um, J from the, the impulsions and the positions and the forces on each of the particles. You take the ensemble average of this time correlation function, you integrate over time, and you get, at the end of the day, you get viscosity. So that type of uh, connection between these correlation functions and uh, transport coefficient, it's called the green kubo relation, which is another name for saying it's a fluctuation dissipation theorem. It relates the response function of the system to the integral of a time correlation function. So it's an FDT in a sense. And that, of course, only holds at equilibrium. And you know that we've uh, used thermal equilibrium because there is a KBT somewhere in front here. So that's why it's an FDT. So from just watching a movie of all the particles in the box, I can essentially measure the quantity that Jill has shown in his first uh, uh, slide. And then we can connect to uh, experiments it if we want. There was a question at the back. It should go down now. It did earlier. Yeah, but the, the screen was going down. So I take the question while. Yeah, sure. Yes. Well, because it's not, it's not really defined on, uh, in terms of density itself, because this overlap is really a delta function, so it's a sum of zeros and ones. So it, you know, it has the same physics, but mathematically it's not directly related. It's not easily related. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it has also the, the disconnected piece, rho squared, rho 
Yeah, but if you look at the overlap, you don't have to subtract anything because when the two density profiles are disconnected, the overlap is zero because you're only counting zero, so you don't have to subtract anything. There was another question somewhere. Yeah. It's gone, yes. Uh, can you directly measure the relaxation time? Yeah, so I think Gilles uh, explained this already, so I won't go through it again. So you have these time correlation functions. I will show you in examples of these time correlation functions in when the projector is ready. And out of the time decay of those, then you extract the relaxation time, and this is the quantities that Gilles has mentioned uh, before. So before uh, we get there, then... <laughs> yes, I will. I have, you know, one more page before we get in the answer. Okay. So I wanted to do a brief history of what we do in simulations of, uh, you know, what people have done. So the boom of computer simulations in liquid is uh, probably the beginning of the 80s, and the first, uh, you know, studies of the class transition that I've read in computer simulations were middle of the uh, 80s, so that's when I think computer simulations started. I don't know much about this uh, literature. Okay. So I think, you know, 10 years later, as people were doing heavy Lee simulations about uh, a glass forming liquids, and then we show you one example in the middle. And uh, essentially it went in parallel with the development of mud coupling theory, and this is what Dave probably is going to explain, Dave Heichmann, uh, sometime later. And this is what people were studying heavily in computer simulations. So near years 2000, this is, uh, well, no, I won't say. So people were studying a lot about, uh, you know, aging phenomena in glasses. They were talking a lot about effective temperatures. And I don't know whether Leticia is going to mention this, these things, but I would be surprised she does not. And this is also when people started to do rheology of glass forming system and studying plasticity and shear flows in supercooled liquids. Uh, yes, 2000, uh, say, five. Then, you know, it was the big boom of uh, dynamic heterogeneities that Jill has mentioned and explained how to measure. And since the beginning of, say, uh, this decade, we talk a lot about static length scales and stuff like this, the Kurtzman transition, the configurational entropy, etc., etc. Okay, so that's typically like uh, the type of things that we study uh, in computer simulations. So I will show you examples of slides of uh, um, numerical measurements from the uh, old days. So I had to do this. Come on. It was there. But it's gone. Let's head here. Okay. Okay, so that's an example from 1989 of the type of the uh, the time correlation function that people were studying uh, uh, some time ago. So I like this paper because Jean-Louis Barra is my uh, PhD supervisor and Jean-Pierre Jean Hansen, he's his uh, PhD supervisor. So they are my dad and my granddad in the uh, scientific uh, tree and I really like them very much. So I wanted to mention their work, even though it's not probably the best figure they have produced in their lives. So look at the time scale they have here. So the dynamic slowdown slows down by half a decade there. So of course they were happy at the time, 1989. <coughs> but th that's about what we had there. So, you know, the beginning of one decade of dynamic slowdown. So then I mentioned these uh, 1995 studies of mud coupling theory. So this is already more serious simulation. So that's Walter Kopp, German type uh, of simulations. So if you look at, you know, how, ma how many decades he was able to simulate and how many decades of viscous slowdown. So this is boring because this is the high temperature liquid. You start to see a shoulder, so that's viscoelasticity. And then you have something like 2.5 decades of dynamic slowdown. And this is exactly the regime you need if you want to uh, study uh, uh, mud coupling theory. So that's uh, 1995. So that's uh, much more recent, so 2010. Because computers go faster, then you can stimulate many more decades, so 10 to the 9. 
So again, I'm cheating because it is all very boring here, but this is about five decades of uh, relaxation time. So that's what you could do in 2009 on, say, heart sphere, which is the simplest uh, uh, system you can uh, uh, imagine. And so now in 2017, um, well, you cannot do much more, maybe 5.5 decades of, uh, of, the of dynamic slowdown in an ordinary computer simulation of a supercooled uh, liquid. Uh, okay, so that's uh, about it. And so now this is a, a figure that I take from a paper that has been uh, rejected several times uh, already, but I like it a lot. Um, so the some co-authors are in the room, so that's why they are laughing, so Patrick in particular. So what I want to uh, do with this figure, I don't want to explain everything, it's a busy figure, um, but this is what I'm going to use for the next two lectures. So this is measurement that we did using computer simulations of hard spheres of this quant magic quantity that was called the configurational entropy in all the lectures. So we have uh, four methods that I will not describe now. And this is as a function of a complicated variable, but it's essentially the temperature. So you decrease the temperature when you go to the left here. So this ZC here is essentially the temperature scale that people were studying 1995, this mass coupling transition theory. And in this uh, blue box here, we don't know for sure, but this is where we locate the experimental glass transition that Jill mentioned before. So it means that between this onset of slow dynamics and this blue box, you have had something like uh, 12 orders of magnitude of the dynamic slowdown. So the first surprising thing, if you followed the first slides of this, is that normally we should be stuck here with five decades of dynamic slowdown. But I will show you in the next lecture that we can essentially now go much beyond that and we can do better than in experiments and go to temperatures that they cannot even access, even Mark cannot even access in an experiment. And not only we can go there, but we can measure this very complicated quantity that have been mentioned before. And so the rest, the next two lectures, it's about you know, explaining how we get this figure. Okay, so uh, it's a figure that maybe will be published uh, one day. Okay, we, we like it very much, and I will use it heavily in the next uh, two lectures. So how did we get this data? So you should recognize something here that looks like the Franz Parisi potential that Julio has mentioned. Uh, one guy, the blue guy, is just a configurational entropy a la Gilles, so S total minus some vibrational component. And this guy here is the point to set correlation length that has been discussed uh, heavily, and so I will describe how to get uh, to this uh, data, not only in the regime uh, accessed by ordinary simulations, but also uh, at much lower temperature, so that's the magic. Uh, before I conclude, because the uh, the projector is on. I have my demagogic slide. So remember that there is a competition about t-shirts. So Leo is, uh, I think, uh, waking up. And so I, I, I did my, uh, my, my homework. So I, I have a proposal for the t-shirt. So the, the conditions were I wanted to have a t-shirt that was not too geek. So I, I want to, to, to wear it myself. <laughs> <coughs> I wanted to have a t-shirt that had nice color, so I like blue, so it will be blue. Um, remember that the school is uh, partly funded by something that's called the cracking the glass problem, so it has some, some, some aspect of it. And it has a little nerd joke about physics, so we talked about the fragile supercool liquid. So that's uh, the t-shirt we uh, have devised. So it, it is blue, it's not too nerd, not too geek. It's about a glass that breaks, okay? So that's my uh, proposal uh, for a t-shirt. So I, I had the idea and Camille did it because I was not able to, to draw it myself on the t-shirt. The so it's, uh, it's nice, no? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, co the contest is open, I guess. <laughs> I'm sure you'll do all uh, much better. Uh, I turn this. Sure, of course. <laughs> Okay, so that was a very long introduction. So I told you about models, about uh, you know, classical fluids, how you reconstruct many interesting quantities from doing simulations. I haven't said a word about how, how you do these simulations uh, in practice. So that's uh, what I'm going to do uh, now. Okay, so we have to, to do a little bit of this. Okay. So that was my uh, very long introduction. So the basic method that you would use 
to study the dynamics and the structure of uh, a classical fluid would be by using molecular dynamics. Mm. So I'll say a few words about uh, you know, molecular dynamics. So what you want to again describe is the time evolution of the positions of a particle. So the power potential is V of R, so it's one of those that I've described before. So essentially, when you do molecular dynamics, so that's the conceptual uh, way of doing molecular dynamics. So you say that the derivative of the position is the velocity, and the derivative of the velocity is the force. Okay. So over J, dV, R I J D R I J. That's it. Okay, so that's uh, the basics of molecular dynamics. If you know how to integrate this equation, you're done. Okay, so you start with some initial conditions for the positions, initial conditions for the velocities, and then you have this. Uh, uh, differential equation to integrate for each uh, position and velocity for all the particles. <coughs> okay, so you get this and you get okay, so how much simpler can it be for all times? And that's it, that's all. I do more, Patrick, about uh, computer simulations. What, what would you do? What? It's hard to see the board. Uh, it's hard to see. Okay, so which one don't you see? So these are Newton's equation. I say you start with initial positions, initial velocities, and you get positions at all times, velocities at all times, and I say that's all. <laughs> The methods to solve these equations, all the tricks of the trade, as it's called, it's all written down and it's, uh, you know, if you want to start to read that book, I will put the reference uh, somewhere later. It's computer simulations of liquid. It's all explained there. So you have all the tricks. Okay, so I will just mention the few key points, but I won't uh, describe that in any detail because it's well known from, you know, the last 30 years. So the first thing you have to do, of course, is you, ha you have to discretize your equations of motion. So it's well uh, explained, understood what's the best, what are the pros and the, you know, the bads and the goods. Of all the tricks, I mentioned just one, because it's probably the most commonly used time discretization for this equation. It's called the velocity Verley algorithm. I write it, it's totally useless, but just to so that you have an idea how it looks. Okay, so you get your positions at time t, your velocities at time t, and you want to go to time t plus delta t, okay? And so this particular algorithm has a one half here at t squared. So this is, uh, you know, you take uh, position, velocities, accelerations at time t, and you propagate the positions from the positions, you get the forces at time t plus delta t, the acceleration. And from this, you get the velocity at time t plus delta t. And then you're done and you continue. And in this particular form of the uh, algorithm, you have a one half e of dt, a of t, plus a t plus delta t. Yeah. And that's it. And then you continue and you continue with the given time discretization. I wanted to mention this one also because I had prepared the joke. So Verle was the advisor of Jean-Pierre Hansen. So he's my uh, grand-granddad okay? uh, in the scientific tree. 
And then we looked at trees the other day at dinner. So the granddad at Verley was Max Born. So I'm super happy. And the grand, 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 granddad was Max Born. Not bad. So that's time uh, discretization. Uh, for this, uh, nothing uh, really uh, complicated there. So what uh, type of things you need to know? So that's the most boring part, I think. So typically, when you read a paper about simulations, all these things are, you know, written down in the little paragraph at the beginning that nobody reads. You know, this is how we discretize the equations. We have a small system, so we use periodic boundary conditions. Sure, I don't have to explain what that means, but you have no boundary, you repeat periodically your system to avoid the boundary. And that's it. Okay, so you know how to discretize, you know how to put boundaries, you have initial conditions, ta -ta -ta, you are careful with your delta t not too big, otherwise it's stupid. And then you can go, so how efficient is that? It's terribly inefficient. So for each particle, you have to propagate the equations of motion. And for each propagation of the equation of motion, you have to compute the forces. So the forces that one particle experiences is because of interactions with everybody else. So for each particle, you have to compute the pair interactions with everybody else. So it costs you n squared. Okay, so you compute the forces. So for each i, you have to sum over all j, so it's good. So it means that the price that you have to pay to propagate the equations are scaling with the system size as n times n. Because for each particle, you have to do n operations. So it's terribly uh, annoying. If you think of a very big system in particular, okay, so you have one particle here, and in t it typically interacts with very few particles. Think of the hard sphere system. It has no interactions if the interparticle is larger than sigma. So this guy and this guy never interact. Okay. So if you open Allen and Tisley, they will tell you it's stupid to do it like this because you only interact with some few particles that are close to you in a given radius that's typically set by the cutoff of the pair potential or a few cutoff like this. So the trick is you first decide which are your neighbors in the computer simulations and then you only compute the forces summed over those neighbors. So assigning the numbers is costly, it's still all over the n squared, but then each operation is costing you something that scales of n. Okay. So you do a list of your neighbors. Oops. Name. Oh. You do a neighbor list, and then, you know, setting up the neighbor list costs you n squared, but then, you know, that's all the list. But the integration itself, it's much less costly. It's just n operations you have to do because the forces are now local. So it's much better you do many propagation that cost you n, and from time to time you update the neighbors uh, later, please. I just want to finish my, uh, uh, my paragraph, and then I take the question. So you still have an operation that is very costly, but the rest of the operations are very uh, fast. So if you have... Uh, typical simulations of glass forming liquids of thousands of particles, it's uh, good enough. We tend to go to much larger systems now because we have the power to do it. Okay, and then it turns out that the uh, computation of the neighbors is so costly that it's uh, killing you. Okay, so one uh, very simple idea is to use cells for much larger systems. Okay, so you add one more layer of complications and you divide your systems into cells. And the first thing you do is you assign a cell to the particle. Okay, so you're asking each particle in which cell are you, that costs you n. Okay, so you know that the particle is inside that cell. And then when you do your neighbor list, instead of summing over all the system that costs you n squared, you only sum over the cells that are here and neighboring you. Okay? So it means that the list now, it becomes of order n uh, again. And then the integration 
is over the N itself. So you can go to much larger system without paying the price. The price is to be, uh, you know, mind more precise in the way you code uh, these uh, things. It all scales like uh, N. And if you want to go uh, even larger, because still if you want to go large, then N becomes large. So N itself becomes a problem because you have too many particles, and millions of particles. Okay, so for even larger, then the only way is to kill the N into pieces. And so what you do is you do parallel computing. Okay, so this is your simulation box. It's becoming bigger and bigger. You've divided into small pieces and you assign one piece to one different computer. Okay, so each part of the system is now uh, 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 integrated in time by a different computer. So if you have 10 computers, then you will, kill, uh, you will divide your system into 10 pieces and then they will all uh, work in parallel. And so the N will be then uh, typically divided by 10. Okay, so that's uh, all I know about uh, fancy simulations. I haven't forgotten the question, but I found to finish my sentence. And all these things are described uh, in the textbook, but that's uh, the key ideas uh, behind. So if you don't want to read the textbook or you don't want to learn anything, then you just uh, download the software. And that's what people do now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not a joke. Okay, and the uh, most popular one probably is called LAMS. I have, I don't remember what the acronym stands for, but it's an open software that started as a small MD code and then it has been made public and then everybody contributed. If you download it, I think in uh, just a few days, you'll be able to do any kind of the computer simulations I described earlier. It has all the pair potentials already, well, many pair potentials already uh, coded. It has the periodic boundary conditions. You can do the parallel uh, calculations already if you have the computer. And that's it, okay? You don't have to learn uh, anything beyond the, beyond the uh, conceptual uh, ideas. There was a question earlier. Oh, you just play with the numbers and you take the best choice. Okay. Okay. So it, it depends on your pair potential, how you could things and what type of integration, you, you know, there is no best answer. So you have to spend one hour changing these numbers, computing how long it takes to do, okay. you know, no good answer to that. Question. Yes? Or because the phenomena you want to study require you to have a large length scales, for instance. So if we had super large length scales at the glass transition, we would need big systems. Fortunately, we don't. So for some calculations we do, we don't need super big systems. Uh, if you want to describe, for instance, the biggest thing we did for uh, bulk uh, glassy systems near the glass transition is probably related to measurements of dynamic heterogeneities, so the type of four-point functions you described. And here you have to have a system that's large enough that you can actually measure these uh, spatial temporal correlation functions with good statistics in them without finite size effects. So here maybe you need, uh, you know, 10 to the 5, few times 10 to the 5, no, 10 to the 5 particle is already quite big. Uh, and that's the only reason that so the physics is dictating you how big you need to be. And for all the measurements we do, normally we change the system size and we stop when it's large enough. You know, no, the big thing. So No, it's just you have one system, but it is the computer itself that takes care of different parts of the system. So, it, you know, the simulation itself is just an ordinary simulation. It's the way you do the simulations that's different. Yep. So, the velocity of the computer integrator is better than the origin, right? Well, I don't even want to answer that question. I mean, you, you read the book and you decide. I, I really don't want to go into these details. I'm not interested myself. Okay? Anyway, when you take one of those, they are all their good and their bad, and you test that you do a good job, and you know, 
frankly, I'm not interested. How do you quench your system? Sorry? How do you quench your system? How do I quench? That's the next uh, page. Okay. So how do you do a simulation in practice? It's the next page. What's funny? Other interesting question? <laughs> <laughs> the thermostat is just the next line, uh, Guillaume, but I think I'm past my uh, time, so the thermostat will be next time. Or maybe I skip it and I answer your question. Um, can I use one minute to skip one page and go faster? Thermostat. Because I won't have time to do anything, okay? So the way I describe the molecular dynamic simulations were by saying we solve Newton's equations. Of course, there is no thermostat uh, there. So you have Newton's equation conserves the, uh, the total energy, but then the, ki the kinetic energy fluctuates and you don't know how to control it because you don't do any work on the system. Hence, I think, uh, Guillaume's uh, clever question. So if you want to <coughs> control the temperature, you have to change the equations of motion. So it's a mess, okay? You have, you have to change the equations of motion. So you have to kick on the particles somehow, and the way you're kicking the particles is affecting their motion. So it means you're killing the physics. So it's forbidden to have a thermostat normally, okay? So of course that's a joke because we need uh, one, okay? So the uh, I think the philosophy behind is that thermostat, again, is one chapter in the book, so there are very interesting questions related to thermostats, what's the best, what's the worst. So you can use any of the thermostats provided that you reach thermal equilibrium with your thermostats, and this is how I do simulations. So I used any crappy thermostat, okay, and you go to LAMS and you have 10 of those, and you choose the best. And I won't give you the name, so everything. So for example, one thing you could do, Guillaume, if you don't want to think too much, you take your velocities and you rescale them such that the kinetic energy is the one you want to assign. And that's it. That's what I do all the time. For some applications, it's very bad. But then the system then flows towards thermal equilibrium at the temperature you chose. So that's selecting the temperature. And then you have prepared your system in some very good thermalized initial conditions. And then what you do in the second part of the simulations, you remove the thermostat, and you do again an NVE simulation, okay, without the thermostat. And then the energy is conserved, the kinetic energy fluctuates around the value you have uh, assigned in the first part of the simulations. But it means your simulation, it's pure, it's nice, it's really the Newton's equation, it's not polluted by stochastic uh, phenomena, okay? So I've gained two pages. Thanks. More questions? NVE means uh, that, oh, sorry, microcanonical. Uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, okay. microcanonical. So the energy is conserved. So if I change and I put a thermostat, then what I have is I have the canonical distribution where I, I apply an external uh, temperature and that's the temperature that's controlled. If I remove the thermostat and the total energy is conserved, I mean the ensemble where the energy is conserved and this is the micro-canonical ensemble that to simulate uh, there. So, so why do you use the thermostat in the first place? Well, you need to decide, you know, viscous uh, slowing down is about, you know, slowing down when you decrease the temperature so you'd better control what no, temperature. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. So you use your thermostat, you apply T, you measure the energy, and you fix it in the second part to the, you know. Yes. How do you decide the thermostat? Well, if you do it that way, you don't have to make big choices because you don't do any measurements with the thermostat on. Okay, that's what I do. I'm not sure many, you know, people do like this. So most people in the room would leave the thermostat. Uh huh. Well, they do, but the, okay. Later. More questions? No. Lunch. <laughs> <laughs>